Well, greetings, everyone. I want to say thank you, first of all, to the Lord Jesus for gathering us here together. It is a sight to behold you all. What a wonderful thing that so many come to, to worship the Lord Jesus Christ as he's appointed by his word. And I want to say thanks to Josh Bice uh, for the very kind invitation. Uh, it is a, a joy and a privilege to be here with you and now to open the word of God to you. Robert Murray McShane is famously remembered for his counsel to learn much of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, for every look at yourself, take 10 looks at Christ. He is altogether lovely. And indeed he is, and that's why it has been such a joy to participate in this conference with you, entirely centered around the person and work of Christ. We have beheld his loveliness together, have we not? And though McShane counsels us to take 10 looks, we're pushing beyond that at the G3 conference and taking 16 looks at Christ. And we come in this session to our 14th look, and I trust you will have not grown tired of looking at Christ yet. The title of the message is Christ the Fountain of Cleansing, and our text will be Luke chapter 5, verses 12 and 13. And leading up to chapter 5 in Luke's gospel, we find Luke presenting testimony after testimony, evidence after evidence, uh, that Jesus of Nazareth really was Israel's promised Messiah, the long-awaited Savior of the world, the second and last Adam who came to undo the curse of sin that the first Adam had brought upon this creation, the seed of the woman who would crush the head of the serpent and destroy his works, the one that God promised all the way back in Genesis 3.15. Luke begins with the accounts of not but one, but two miraculous births announced by angels, the birth of John, the forerunner of Messiah, and then of Jesus himself. There's the testimony of Mary and Zacharias that, a child would be, that this child would be the fulfillment of God's promises to Abraham and to David. In Luke 2, the glory of Yahweh lights up the night sky as an angel of the Lord announces the Savior has been born. Simeon and Anna see the baby and declare that they have seen salvation, that redemption has come to Jerusalem. In chapter 3, John calls the people to prepare the way of the Lord. The promised seed has come. The Holy Spirit descends upon Jesus at his baptism, testifying that this Jesus was God's anointed one. The Father himself declares audibly from heaven, you are my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And then Luke gives Jesus genealogy, tracing his lineage all the way back to Adam, showing that he was truly human. And so setting the stage for his temptation, which we see in the beginning of chapter 4 as Luke presents Jesus as the second and last Adam, withstanding and defeating Satan in his three temptations in the wilderness and contrasting that with how the first Adam succumbed to Satan's three temptations in the garden. Jesus conquers precisely where Adam fails, showing himself that he is qualified to undertake his public ministry. And Luke continues into chapter 4 demonstrating that Jesus not only has the credentials to be Messiah, but that he has the power and authority of God himself. In verses 31 to 37, Jesus demonstrates his power over Satan and the kingdom of darkness by casting a demon out of a possessed man. In verses 38 and 39, he demonstrates his power over disease by instantly healing Peter's mother-in-law of a debilitating fever. Verse 40 says, all those who had any who were sick with various diseases brought them to him, and he was healing them. And then in chapter 5, verses 1 to 11, he demonstrates his lordship over creation itself by miraculously supplying the abundant catch of fish after Peter and the fishermen worked all night and caught nothing. This Jesus is God. 
This Jesus is Messiah. This Jesus is Savior. He is the second Adam, already having emerged victorious over the temptations of Satan, now plundering Satan's kingdom by his power and by his compassion. He is making it plain that he is there to reverse the curse of sin that brought decay and disease and spiritual bondage. And in our text, Jesus continues showcasing his divine power over disease by cleansing a leper. Let's read Luke chapter 5, verses 12 and 13. While he was in one of the cities, behold, there was a man covered with leprosy. And when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and implored him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And he stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately the leprosy left him. While in one sense this looks like just another scene of Jesus' divine power to overcome the effects of sin, there's more to it than that. In Scripture, this disease of leprosy stands out among all the ailments and diseases of a fallen creation. Leprosy was singled out by God to be a picture or a parable of human sin. John MacArthur calls it an irresistible analogy of sin. See, you and I are all spiritual lepers. The leprosy of sin has infected us all to the core of our being, all of our faculties, our minds, our hearts, our wills, our consciences have all been diseased by spiritual leprosy. And so we all stand in need of cleansing from the great fountain of cleansing that is the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, we must come to him for cleansing. And we must come to him in precisely the same way that this leper came to him. And when we do, this text teaches us that we will find Christ to be just as this leper found him, full of compassion and mighty to save. J.C. Ryle wrote, we have in this wonderful history a lively emblem of Christ's power to heal our souls. Spurgeon said, now is the Son of Man glorious in his power to save. And so as we walk slowly through this miraculous scene, I want you to see yourselves for the spiritual lepers that you are. And I want you to see the Lord Jesus Christ for the glorious, compassionate, mighty Savior that he is. The fountain of cleansing for the leprosy of your soul. If you're an unbeliever, if you haven't yet come to a saving knowledge of Christ, I want you to come to him for cleansing. And if you already have washed your sins away in the fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, I want you to see and celebrate his glory with me. And rejoice how one so lovely and so holy comes so willingly and eagerly and graciously to cleanse and heal ones so vile, so repulsive, and undeserving as we are. Well, let's look first at the sinner's contamination. Number one, the sinner's contamination, verse 12. While he was in one of the cities, behold, there was a man covered with leprosy. Well, what was this leprosy? In the original language, the basic meaning of the term is scaly. It was a general term for any number of skin conditions, including what we might today identify as psoriasis, ringworm, and cutaneous lupus. But the most severe disease denoted by the term leprosy was what is now known as Hansen's disease, what we normally think of as leprosy, where bacteria damage the nervous system to the point that people can't feel any pain. It was long supposed that leprosy was some sort of flesh-eating bacteria uh, that caused a person's extremities to fall off. It was common to see lepers with missing toes or nubs for fingers and assume that, well, the disease just ate away at the flesh. But it's been discovered that those extremities don't fall off, they rub off. Due to the loss of feeling from the nerve damage, victims of leprosy wear their body parts away. 
A stubbed toe becomes a, a broken toe that you continue to walk on until the bone is exposed and the wound is infected. Accidentally placing a hand on a surface, a hot surface, causes no pain, and so severe burns result. Noses and ears wear away from just being rubbed and scratched over and over again. So it was common to see lepers with open sores, oozing ulcers, and raw flesh. And leprosy was an issue known in the ancient world, certainly in Israel. In Luke 4.27, Jesus says there were many lepers in Israel in the times of Elisha the prophet. It was common enough that there were prescriptions in the ceremonial law for how to deal with it. The law devotes two long chapters, Leviticus 13 and 14, to teaching the priests how to identify leprosy and what to do with those who were infected. They function something like ancient dermatologists. Leviticus 13.3 says if there's a mark on the skin and it turns white, uh, the hair turns white, and then the, if the infection seems to be deeper than the skin, well, then it's leprosy and the man is unclean. But if the bright spot doesn't seem to be beneath the surface, well, he needs to isolate for seven days and then be re-examined. This is back when they used to quarantine the sick. If it's not spreading, he can be released. If it is spreading, then he's unclean. Now, why was this such a big deal? Well, because Yahweh was dwelling in the camp of Israel. Exodus 40, the Shekinah glory of God fills the tabernacle, and God signifies that he is dwelling with his people. Holiness was in their midst, and yet leprosy was defiling. It was ceremonial uncleanness, and uncleanness cannot dwell alongside perfect purity. So Numbers 5, 2, and 3, God says, Command the sons of Israel that they send away from the camp everyone with leprosy, everyone having a discharge, everyone who's unclean because of contact with a dead person. You shall send away both male and female. You shall send them outside the camp so that they do not defile the camp where I dwell in their midst. God was in the camp. And because leprosy is defiling, because it is unclean, that meant the leper could not be in the camp. Listen to Leviticus 13, 45 and 46. As for the person who has the leprous infection, his clothes shall be torn, and the hair of his head shall be uncovered, and he shall cover his mustache and call out, unclean, unclean. He shall remain unclean all the days during which he has the infection. He is unclean. He shall live alone. He shall live outside the camp. This was a defiling disease. Many described it as a living death. In fact, in Numbers 12, 12, when God strikes Miriam with leprosy, Moses prays for her and asks God not to let her be like one dead whose flesh is half eaten away. Spurgeon said, this disease turns a man into a mass of loathsomeness, a walking pile of pests. Leprosy is nothing better, Spurgeon said, than a horrible and lingering death. It was death in slow motion. And so because leprosy was defiling, a living death, it was also an isolating disease. So much so that if a leper went anywhere, he had to announce his uncleanness with a loud voice so that nobody would be defiled by his uncleanness. Leprosy was lonely. Second Chronicles 26, 21 says that the leper had to live in a separate house for he was cut off from the house of the Lord. In Luke 17, 12, Luke introduces a group of lepers by saying, 10 men with leprosy who stood at a distance. And they, would have, and they met Jesus. And they would have had to stand at a distance. The rabbis taught you couldn't come within six feet of a leper. And if the wind was blowing that day, it was 150 feet. The leper's life was a lonely life. Away from his wife, away from his children, a stranger to the comforts and pleasures of any sort of companionship, in some cases struggling to remember what it felt like to touch another human being. He was an outcast, a castaway. 
But not only was leprosy defiling and isolating, it was also eminently shameful. Shameful. You heard it in Leviticus 13. He had to tear his clothes, shave his head, cover his mouth, and announce that he was unclean lest he defile anyone else. A leper's uncleanness became his identity. Unclean. Unclean. Hi, my name is Unclean. One rabbi in the Talmud advocated throwing stones at lepers to force them to keep their distance as if they were a pack of wild dogs. Their humanity was totally stripped from them. They were themselves a disease, an infection, and nothing more. And beyond the shame, leprosy also brought with it the curse of God. The Israelites believed that lepers were being punished by God, and the Old Testament does record several instances of God wielding leprosy as a judgment against sin. Mentioned in Numbers 12, God strikes Miriam with leprosy for speaking against Moses. Second Chronicles 26 tells us that Yahweh had smitten King Uzziah with leprosy because he had usurped the role of the priests. And so it came to be believed that lepers were under the judgment of God, and so it was permissible and even right to treat them with contempt. More than that, leprosy was regarded as incurable, a hopeless disease. The king of Aram in 2 Kings 5 hears that Elisha the prophet can heal lepers, and so he sends his military commander, Naaman, to the king of Israel to be cured of his leprosy. And 2 Kings 5, 7 says, but when the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, am I God to kill and to make alive that this man is sending word to me to cure a man of leprosy? Leprosy was regarded as so incurable that one would have to be God himself to cure it. Am I God to kill and keep alive? Cleansing a leper was on the order of raising the dead. In fact, in all the prescriptions for the priests in Leviticus 13 and 14, there is nothing about how to treat the disease. If there was leprosy, the man was unclean and cut off. If it was uncertain, he quarantined a week to see if he got better or worse. But there is no talk of remedy. The law provides no cure for leprosy. You can imagine this man going to the priest to be examined and them coming to him with a grave expression and saying, we are so sorry, but there's nothing we can do. You are a condemned man. You are unclean. And he would have begged them, no, please, is there nothing to be done? I'll do anything. And they would have apologized again and said, no, there's nothing to be done. The law provides only for your condemnation. And I hope as we consider the awful corruption of leprosy that you can see yourself in this leper. I hope you can hear how appropriate a picture leprosy is for the corruption of sin that afflicts each and every one of us by nature. Like leprosy, sin is defiling. Isaiah 64, 6, all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment. Like leprosy, sin's de defilement is totalizing. Our entire constitution is infected with sin. Isaiah 1, 5, and 6 speaks of sinners and says, the whole head is sick and the whole heart is faint from the sole of the foot even to the head there is nothing sound in it only bruises, welts and raw wounds our understanding is darkened our hearts are made of stone our affections are corrupt our conscience is defiled and our wills are enslaved to sin in our natural state life in sin is a living death as Paul speaks of the unbelieving dead in our trespasses and sins. Like leprosy, sin isolates. It makes us unfit for any fellowship with God. If physical uncleanness couldn't dwell in the presence of the manifestation of the presence of God of Israel, how much more does our spiritual uncleanness alienate us from the very presence of God himself? Isaiah 59, 2 says, your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. We must 
be forever cast out of God's presence so as not to defile his dwelling place. And sin also makes us unfit for fellowship with the people of God. In 1 Corinthians 5.13, Paul cites the Old Testament law and commands the church, remove the wicked man from among yourselves. The leper is an outcast with God and his people. The spiritual leper is to be expelled from the fellowship of the righteous. And the shame of our sin, if we could truly see it as God sees it, is unbearable. We are a spiritual mass of loathsomeness, as Spurgeon said, a walking pile of pests. Our sin is an abomination. It is abhorrent and repulsive. It is a stench in the nostrils of holiness. Anyone with any dignity about them would be right to demand that we warn them of our presence so that we might not contaminate them with our uncleanness. If we saw the loathsomeness of our sin rightly, we would acknowledge that we deserve to be kept at bay with stones as they did to lepers. Like leprosy, those infected with the disease of sin are under, uh, under a divine curse. Cursed is everyone who does not buy, abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. And like leprosy, our sin is incurable. Jeremiah 13, 23. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Then you also can do good who are accustomed to doing evil. Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is more deceitful than all else and is incurable. Friends, this man's misery is our misery. If only we have eyes to see. We have broken the law of the Holy One of Israel. We have belittled His glory. We have preferred filth over beauty. We are abominable. We are unclean. We are loathsome to our very core. We are full of shame. Nobody should want anything to do with us, least of all, the thrice holy God of the universe. We are outcasts, fit only for the depths of hell itself. And if we have any sense of ourselves at all, we cry out, oh, eternal punishment, death in my sins, bearing my own guilt, no, please, is there nothing to be done? I will do anything to make peace with God. And the answer is no, there is nothing to be done. The law of God provides only for your condemnation. We can do nothing to rid the leprosy from our souls. But this leper sees Jesus. The law provides only for your condemnation, but what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did sending his own son. We've seen the sinner's contamination. Let's look now at the sinner's contrition. The sinner's contrition, verse 12. And when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and implored him. The parallel passage in Mark 1.40 says, a leper came to Jesus, beseeching him and falling on his knees before him. This is total brokenness, total humiliation. This man knows who he is. He takes the posture of total humility. He falls on his knees and then on his face. He acknowledges his uncleanness. He knows he's undeserving. And so he takes that posture of humility, even of reverence, even of worship. Lord, this man doesn't try to soft sell his condition. He doesn't say, well, you know, sure, I got a little leprosy on the whole. I think I'm a pretty healthy person, though. And we hear much of that sort of thing today as sinners flatter themselves that their sinfulness isn't as foul and as vile as the Bible says it is. You know, sure, I'm not perfect. I'm, you know, I'm human. I make mistakes just like everybody else. But on the whole, I think I'm a pretty good person. God knows my heart. I think he'll see my sincerity and be pleased with me. This man says nothing like that. Nothing. He knows that is nonsense. He is covered with leprosy, the text says, and so he comes with a, the broken spirit and the contrite heart that Psalm 51, 17 says the Lord does not despise. He comes in full confession and acknowledgement of his uncleanness, just as the truly repentant sinner must come to Christ, not making excuses for his sin, 
but openly confessing how totally corrupted he is, recognizing that he's got no hope for forgiveness apart from the mercy of God. And so he falls down on his face, bowed in abject humility, begging God for undeserved grace. But notice that the sinner's contrition is not only marked by humility, it's marked by desperation. Because this is not supposed to happen. Lepers aren't supposed to be anywhere near a crowd of people. He should be quarantined. Or at least he should be crying out unclean and keeping his distance. He shouldn't be approaching anyone, let alone a rabbi. But what drives such holy recklessness? That brings us in the third place to the sinner's confidence. The sinner's confidence. Verse 12, again, he fell on his face and implored him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. This man knows he's an outcast. He knows he belongs nowhere near Jesus, but he feels the pain of his defilement, his isolation, and his shame so acutely He recognizes the utter helplessness of his uncleanness so intensely that he is desperate. He has this sense of holy abandon, so much so that he throws caution and custom to the wind and falls on his face and begs Jesus, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. You can end my shame. You can purify my uncleanness. You can cleanse my filth. And we see this holy desperation often in the Gospels, don't we? The woman had a hemorrhage of blood for 12 years and endured much at the hands of many physicians. She spent all she had, only gotten worse, and she thought to herself, if only I could get close to him. I know I'm not supposed to touch him, but if I could just touch his clothes, he can heal me. The Syrophoenician woman says, yes, Lord, I know I'm a dog, And I don't deserve the children's bread, but Lord, even the dogs eat the crumbs from the children's table. Blind Bartimaeus sits begging along the road to Jericho when he hears that Jesus was passing by and he cries out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And they say, shut up, Bartimaeus, he's not here for you. Quit bothering him. And the text says, but he kept crying out all the more. Do you see? People who are sensible of their need, whose afflictions have bowed them to the dust, have this holy desperation, this holy abandon that says, I know I'm not supposed to. I know I've got no claim to his mercy, but I've got to go to him. I've got to bring him my uncleanness. And sinner, you and I must come the same way. Perhaps you've been taught to think that the filth of your uncleanness ought to keep you from coming to Jesus. No, if you come to him in humble contrition, bowed to the dust, moved by a holy desperation, fueled by the confidence that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, our Savior, let every custom and every caution be thrown to the wind. Come to Christ for cleansing. Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. How precious is this confession of the sinner's confident faith? Some interpreters note that this is a third-class conditional, and they conclude that the man is doubtful of Jesus' willingness to heal him. But I wouldn't call this doubt as much as I would call it modesty. He recognizes that Jesus is sovereign over the execution of his own power. He realizes that he has no claim upon the mercy of the Son of God. He doesn't go to the Jesus demanding, Lord, if you're loving and just at all, you must make me clean. No. He says, Lord, you owe me nothing. I am, after all, an unclean leper. But I know you can do as you please. If you're willing, I know it is within your power to heal me. And how does the Lord respond? Let's look forth at the Savior's cleanness. The Savior's cleanness. Verse 13, and he stretched out his hand and touched him. And this is truly astounding. Everybody else in that crowd would have seen that leper coming, maybe even smelled that leper coming, and they would have taken 10 steps back. 
if not for the sheer repulsiveness of the man's condition, at the very least because the law of God forbade anyone from touching a leper lest they be defiled. Uh, Leviticus 5.3, if a person touches human uncleanness, even if it's hidden from him, he will be guilty. Not a single person in Israel, and certainly no rabbi, would have ever gotten within striking distance of a leper. But Jesus doesn't draw back. Jesus stretches out his hand and touches him. Everybody in the crowd would have gasped. He's defiling himself, they would have said. But was he defiling himself? No. Everyone else touches the leper and is defiled by the leper's uncleanness. But such is Jesus' holiness and purity and cleanness that Jesus touches the leper and the leper becomes clean. The leper's uncleanness doesn't contaminate Jesus' purity. Jesus' purity is so boundless and bottomless that his purity contaminates the leper's uncleanness. Jesus infects this man with the contagion of heaven. And the touch of the Savior's cleanness overcomes the sinner's defilement. Dear friends, something greater than the ceremonial cleansing laws is here. This Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. It's not as though Jesus had no regard for the laws of purification. It's not as if he was lawless or treated the law of God with contempt. No, he loved the law of God. But the Son of Man had come. And the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. And so don't marvel when the Son of Man heals on the Sabbath. The Sabbath only ever existed to point to the rest that sinners could find by trusting in Messiah for righteousness. The leprosy laws and purification laws only ever existed to point to the final cleansing that sinners could receive by trusting in the man that they were looking at at that moment. Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. He has come to touch the unclean. When Peter manifests his divine glory, uh, when Jesus manifests to Peter his divine glory in the miraculous catch of fish in, earlier in Luke 5, Peter is gripped with the reality of his own sinfulness before this one whom he's coming to understand is holy God. And he says, Luke 5, 5, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. I don't deserve to be anywhere near you. And you don't deserve to have to be anywhere near me. But Jesus is not repelled by uncleanness. Not from one like this leper who is ravaged by the effects of the fall, who is humbled by it, and who begs for mercy because of it. Jesus is repelled more by the arrogant leper who doesn't feel his shame, who doesn't come for cleansing, but who trusts in his own power to cleanse whatever little filth he thinks he has. But to the despairing sinner, aware of his inability, Jesus draws near to that one, even in his defilement. Go away from me, Lord. I don't want the sin, my sin to defile you. No, friend, you don't understand. I've come for the unclean. I've come to embrace the outcast. I've come to touch the loathsome, I've come to cleanse the unclean. Friend, do you feel a keen sense of the pain and the shame of your sin? That's good. That's good. You ought to feel that shame. But don't let it keep you from coming to Jesus. Let the pain and shame of your sin drive you to Jesus because the cleanness of his righteousness overcomes the uncleanness of your sin. And he accomplishes that by doing so much more than touching you in your defilement. He takes your defilement upon himself and then takes up residence inside you. God the Son traverses the infinite chasm between heaven and earth, between divine and human, by assuming to himself a full and genuine human nature. He lives the perfect life of obedience that you were commanded to live but failed to live. And he goes to the cross to bear your uncleanness in his own body. He bore our sins in his body on the cross. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf 
that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. This Savior does not just zap your spiritual leprosy from the, away from the safe harbors of heaven. No, he has skin in the game, literally. He comes up close. He embraces you, sinner, and, and your sin into his very arms. He lays you upon his very shoulders and he himself suffers the law's awful penalty for your uncleanness in such a way that he and you as well united to him come out clean on the other side. What a savior we have who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession. But I want you to notice, Jesus didn't need to touch this man to heal him. All throughout the Gospels, we see Jesus exercise his divine power to perform miracles with a word. Lord, I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. Peace, be still. Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Lazarus, come forth. When this leper comes to Jesus begging him to be cleansed, Jesus could have healed this man from a safe distance with the command of his voice. Why does he touch him? That brings us to our fifth point, the Savior's compassion. Luke doesn't mention it here, but the parallel account in Mark 1.41 says, moved with compassion, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him. No one would have touched this man for quite some time. His case of leprosy was obviously very advanced. Luke says this man was covered with leprosy. Literally, it is full of leprosy. It's likely that years had passed since anyone had touch, touched him, and the starvation for human contact would have been palpable. And Jesus, whom this man regards as Lord, before whom this man came and fell on his face, the one whom this man believes can make him clean, if only he was willing, Jesus, the fountain of all cleanness himself, initiates the human contact that this man would have ached for. The sinner was full of leprosy. The Savior was full of compassion. And he expresses that compassion not only with a touch, but also with this glorious reply, I am willing, be cleansed. What a treasure chest, what an absolute gold mine of comfort and consolation these precious words are to broken and unclean sinners. I am willing. Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. I am absolutely convinced of your power. You can end my shame. You can purify my uncleanness, but I'm not entirely sure of your heart toward me. After all, I have no claim upon you. I am an unclean leper. I don't deserve your mercy. I deserve to be discarded for my uncleanness. But, oh, Lord, if you might be willing... If, I might, if you might find it in your heart to have pity upon my misery, I know that you can make me clean. And without a moment's hesitation, Jesus touches the untouchable and says, I am willing, be cleansed. Oh, what tenderness must have been in Jesus' face, in his voice, how full his heart must have been to bring the blessing of heaven, the healing power of the kingdom of God into this miserable man's condition. Here was an image bearer of God, ruined by the curse of the enemy, and now casting himself upon the mercy of the Savior for cleansing. Jesus didn't utter these words with casual indifference. Yeah, sure, pal, be cleansed. No. How eager and how delighted Jesus must have been to heal this man. I mean, think of yourselves. 
You hear some horrible report of a friend or a family member afflicted with some terrible disease and, and, and how you feel it in the pit of your stomach, how you ache to say, oh, if, if I could only wave a hand and heal them of their affliction, if I could only do what the charlatans of the charismatic movement claim to be able to do, I'd empty the children's hospitals. I'd empty every wheelchair I could find. And dear friend, if, if that compassion wells up in your own heart, as, and you're as sinful as, you're, as you are, imagine what compassion welled up in the Savior's heart as he looked upon this miserable creature and smiled and said, I am willing. I am willing. This is the Savior who saw the grief in Mary's eyes filled with tears and was deeply moved in spirit, who wept with the sisters at Lazarus' tomb. This is the Savior who sees the widow of Nain weeping for, for the death of her only son and felt compassion for her, raised the man from the dead, and the text says Jesus gave him back to his mother. The young girl lies dead in a house of weeping and wailing mourners, and Jesus says, why are you weeping? She's just asleep. And taking her tenderly by it, the hand, he said in a voice, that must have been ever so gentle, little girl, I say to you, get up. And then he gives that sweet girl back to her family. Friends, you have no need to doubt this Savior's willingness to rescue you from your uncleanness. He is willing. He is full of compassion for sinners, and if you will come to him the way this leper came to him, humiliated, desperate, ashamed of your sin, but, a, but confident in his power to save, he will receive you. You may be full of sin, but he is full of compassion for sinners. And that brings us to our final point in verse 13, number six, the Savior's capacity. The Savior's Capacity. Jesus says, I am willing, be cleansed. And Luke says, and immediately the leprosy left him. The leprosy had come upon this man in stages. First a rash, then an open sore, then ulcers, until he finally became the mass of loathsomeness that he was when he came to Jesus, full of leprosy. But Jesus gives the word, be cleansed. And immediately he is cleansed. What a sight that must have been to see shriveled, scaly, corroded skin immediately soften, to see the white scabs and red scars turn to healthy flesh, to see fingers and toes grow back, to see ears and, and noses grow back. This was a divine miracle. Friends, how feeble and ill-founded would our faith be if our Savior had all the compassion in the world upon poor sinners and wished all the best that, he could, that could be wished but was powerless to do anything about it? Oh, but our Christ, he is not just benevolent. He is not just compassionate. He is willing and able. He speaks and the winds and the waves are stilled. He commands and the demons come out. He calls and the dead man rises from the grave. Little girl, I say to you, get up, and immediately the girl got up and began to walk. Young man, I say to you, arise, and the dead man sat up and began to speak. I am willing, be cleansed. And the leper, who was regarded as a dead man, whom no one could heal but God alone, is immediately cleansed. Jesus is God. He is Lord of creation, and therefore he is the Lord of the new creation who is making all things new. Spurgeon said, the I will of an emperor may have great power of his dominions, but the I will of Christ drives death and hell before him. It conquers disease, removes despair, and floods the world with mercy. The Lord's I will can put away your leprosy of sin and make you perfectly whole. And that's the point, the Savior who can remove with a word the leprosy of the body is the Savior who can remove the leprosy of the soul. Yes, we have been infected to the very core of our being, but the Savior's capacity is such that he gives the word and your spiritual death will be turned to spiritual life. J.C. Ryle wrote, no heart disease is so deep-seated 
but he is able to cure it. No plague of soul is so virulent, but our great physician can heal it. Let us never despair of anyone's salvation so long as he lives. Where does that leave us? It leaves us with two words of application. First, to the unbeliever, to the spiritual leper, to you who still labor under the burdens of the foulness and the filth of your sin. I call you to come to Christ. Come to this fountain of cleansing for your salvation. Despite what you may think, despite what you may be willing to admit about yourself, you are full of leprosy. Perhaps not on the outside, you may be the picture of health and beauty on the outside, but if you could see your heart as God sees it, you would see yourself covered with the most loathsome spiritual leprosy down to the very depths of your soul. Your heart is corroded with the defiling disease of sin. And you'd think, okay, I confess that I'm sinful, but I'll do better. I'll reform myself. Tell me what to do to effect my cleansing. And, and friend, God's law does not make any provision for your cleansing, only for your condemnation. All of your efforts will prove fruitless. All of your religious devotion will only make you more unclean because all your righteousness is as filthy rags. Well, if that's the case, you say, then I have no hope. I must perish forever in the filth of my sin. And no, dear friend, the same law that condemns you was given to point you to the one who fulfilled the law, to the one who was never unclean. And what does this Savior do? What has he done? The leprosy of sin required your isolation, your banishment from the presence of God and the fellowship of his people. Leviticus 13, 46, again, the leper shall live alone, his dwelling shall be outside the camp. Friend, Jesus went to Gethsemane alone. The one who once heard the Father's voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I have well pleased, called upon his Father in the garden and heard silence. He was abandoned by his disciples during his trial. I do not know the man. In the mystery of mysteries, he was abandoned even by the Father as he cried out those wretched words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Hebrews 13, 12 says that Jesus suffered outside the gate. The next verse says he suffered outside the camp. Do you see it? You deserved to be banished from your leprosy. But Jesus endured the banishment in the place of his people, that we might be accepted, that we might be welcomed, that we might be restored. And because of that perfectly sufficient sacrifice, Jesus still does not shrink back from vile sinners. He is still moved with compassion today. He still stretches out his hands to the unclean. He still, as it were, looks the sinner in the eye and says, I am willing. I am. He still speaks and all creation obeys. The winds and the waves still know his voice who ruled them while he dwelt below. He has obeyed where you have failed. He has died in the place of sinners. He has risen to demonstrate victory and he calls you this day to repent of sin and to trust in him alone for righteousness. And for everyone he does, he says, be cleansed and immediately their leprosy leaves them. Come to Christ. What could stop you? What could keep you from one such so kind and compassionate and glorious a Savior? Bring your sin to the one willing and able to cleanse you. And then I have a second word of application to my brothers and sisters who are saved. You who know your leprosy to have been cleansed, but who, like me, so often return to your uncleanness. How often do we, who have been freed, return to our bondage? And yet here is reason to come to Christ, the fountain of cleansing, again and again and again. Each day, as we sin afresh, we must betake ourselves to Christ afresh. Each day. And friend, he still receives you. He came near to you when you were full of leprosy. How much more now that you only bring the remnants of sin? 
How much more does he say after the definitive cleansing has already taken place? How much more does he say, I am willing, be cleansed? You say, no, Mike, you don't understand. I've come so many times confessing the same sin over and over. How could he ever take me back? How could he ever have hope that I'm truly repentant this time? Dear friend, this is the Savior who welcomes sinners, who came not to call the righteous, but sinners. The Savior who came not for the healthy, who have no need of a physician, but for the sick. The Savior who did the greater for us by taking his leprosy upon himself and bearing the full fury of the wrath of God against us will not fail to do the lesser for us and cleanse the remnants of sin's presence and purify for himself a people for his own possession. Brothers and sisters, go to him every morning in full acknowledgement of your leprosy and tell him, Lord, here I am again. I've defiled myself again. I've shamed myself again, but Lord, If you are willing, you can make me clean. And as you look to the pages of Scripture and look up, as it were, into his smiling face and his outstretched arms and hear him say in triumphant majesty, my dear child, how precious you are to me. There, there is my blood on the doorposts of your heart. There I see the robe of my own obedience draped across your shoulders. I am not ashamed to call you my brethren. I am willing. Be cleansed. Dear people, could you refuse him? Could you walk away from one so lovely? Lord, where else can we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. That kind of boundless compassion, rooted not in some sort of sentimentalism, but in his own blood-stained cross, that makes me want to root out every vestige of remaining sin in my life. What a motivation to holiness is a compassionate Savior. Can he be so tender with you day after day, sin after sin, prayer after prayer, and you still live in the sin that he cleansed you from? No, you can't. You've been driven by his own loveliness to make war on your sin. You've been delightfully compelled to put to death the deeds of the body because you cannot wallow in the uncleanness that he has cleansed. There may I, though vile as he, wash all my sins away, and the blood of the dying lamb shall never lose its power till all the ransomed church of God be saved to sin no more. Let's pray. Oh, Father, would you accomplish it? Would you do it in the hearts of your people? Would you call your sheep into your fold? Save people, send the Spirit now to open the blind eyes and dead hearts of sinners to see the loveliness of the glory of Christ and grant the gifts of repentance and faith in him that all sin might be washed away. And Lord, would you open our eyes to the bounty of the Lord Jesus' compassion and his willingness and his eagerness to own us as brethren, even though we feel ourselves to be so unworthy of his touch. We have no reason to think of Jesus as a hard savior. We have every reason to come to him with every fault. He breaks the power of canceled sin and he sets the prisoner free. His blood makes the foulest clean, his blood availed for me. Father, get what you are worthy of in your people by the work of Christ and the working of the Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.